Blog Talk Radio. Your journey begins right now. From the west coast of British Columbia to you listening around the world and blasting out into the universe, welcome to tonight's edition of Space Out Radio. Call us at 1 607 203 5344. Tweet us at Spaced Out Radio, find Dave on Facebook at Spaced Out Radio, or Skype us at Spaced Out Radio. Now, here's your host, Dave Scott. Good evening and welcome to Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott, and thank you so much for tuning in to SpacedOutRadio.com as we come in from the frozen Canadian tundra, battle our way past the wild animals, sidestep Bigfoot, and enter Uncle Jimbo's cabin, stoke the fire, heat this place up, and broadcast to you live on this Tuesday night, early Wednesday morning, if you're on the East Coast. Here at SOR, we do this thing seven days a week. We want to be your official one-stop shop when it comes to the paranormal, ufological, spiritual, extraterrestrial, and so much more. If you're a social media junkie like I am, you can follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show, and you can ask to join our private Spaced Out Radio group, as well as our other group, Podcast Central. On Instagram, you can follow me at Dave Scott, S-O-R. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show, and of course our website is spacedoutradio.com. At this time, we'd like to welcome all our listeners and fans listening in in the Spaced Out Radio chat room, along with those at Paranormal End of the Night and Paranormal Forum. If you head to our website, you can click on Cat's Corner. Psychic Catherine Fallman will answer one lucky listener's submitted question per week. Tonight's show is brought to you by Rivulet Reiki and Readings, providing healings in person or at a distance. Spaced Out Radio listeners receive a 10% discount on pricing. Purpleplates.com help heal your body, mind, and soul. Drop into their site and heal yourself today. 80,000 people a month read the new Agora newspaper. Find out what's happening around the world on the other side of politics, health, supernatural, paranormal, and so much more. And if you have a dollar and you have an iPhone, you can download the Spirit Story Box. Spirit Story Box, the official ghost sending app of Spaced Out Radio. When it comes to the field of the paranormal, there are always more questions than answers to the evidence that comes through. Now, when I say paranormal, I mean the entire field, from ghosts to UFOs to everything in between. What if they are real? What if are the different realms surrounding us? What if people are getting taken and it's just not nightmares? What if? Well, That becomes a very important question tonight now, doesn't it? What If is also the name of the new book from author Bob Mitchell. What If, Close Encounters of the Unusual Kind, can now be found on Amazon right now. The one thing I like about writers like Bob is he's a true journalistic talent. His background is journalism, over four decades. Here's a guy who's been a true crime reporter, a political and sports reporter as well with the Toronto Star. So tonight... I also think it's important to find out from someone with 40 years of journalistic experience as to why they put their reputation on the line to start writing nonfiction tales about UFOs and alien abduction. I mean, we all know the mainstream media, whether it's print, radio, or television, doesn't really take these topics seriously. So this is something we need to find out. Bob Mitchell, welcome to Space Out Radio tonight. How are you? Fabulous, Dave, and it's a pleasure to be on uh, one of the few Canadian shows like this uh, that are out there right now. And uh, I'm really happy that you've been able to, uh, you know, knock down that American niche and have a can- truly Canadian show on the topic that uh, I think more people than want to admit are really interested in. You know what? I, I think you're right on that, Bob. And we have a lot of American listeners, and I have been asked so many times why we don't have more Canadian guests on. And my answer is, there are none. Very, yeah, few, people, very few people in Canada want to discuss the topics of ufology and extraterrestrials, especially when it comes to contact or abduction. Why do you think that is? Um, well, that's, that's a very good question. I, I, you know, I think being a Canadian, uh, we're, we're always looking to the States for answers on everything. 
And I just think over the years, like all the UFO sh shows have come out of the United States, uh, you know, the, the coast to coast has been on for, geez, I would probably think more than 20 years, if not longer, on di with different hosts. And, and that's been the staple. And then most of the, the shows uh, that are on the, the the U.S. networks uh, we deal with alien and paranormal. They're all from the states too. So it's it's just not been something that a lot of uh, you know people have wanted to invest money in to try to create their own uh, UFO network here in Canada. Um, I must say it's getting a little better because there are some really really uh, fascinating experts. And and one of the things that I I didn't know uh, even until two years ago was that uh, I didn't realize that. Stanton Friedman, who you know, is a well-known uh, UFO uh, personality in all the American shows and one of the go-to people, actually uh, lives in Fredericton, New Brunswick, and he's a Canadian now, married a Canadian um, many years ago and has been living here probably more than a decade. And, and so we have somebody like that, and Grant Cameron, another well-known yes. uh, person in, from Winnipeg, and and, and uh, <coughs> when I was down at the uh, MUFON um uh, World Convention in Philadelphia, uh, actually it was Cherry Hill in New Jersey, uh, just uh, south of Philadelphia uh, two years ago. Um, there was basically eight people from Canada that were members of MUFON that were down there. And, and at the time, um, there was such a thing as MUFON Canada, but it was very, you know, maybe one or two people. That was it. And uh, so the eight of us got together and thought that, you know, maybe MUFON Canada should... Uh, branch away from the international body and then become a sort of a chapter on its own and and that's what we've tried to do um i i i was a field investigator for mufon canada for a couple of years but i've sort of dropped away from that uh, right now because um i found myself not really interested in stories or, or, or listening to people talk about lights in the sky i i was much more interested in the the real nitty gritty of, of actual people telling me their um, encounter stories with uh, mm -hmm. other worldly beings. And, um, so that's what I've been doing. Uh, I'm still connected with Move on Canada, but mm -hmm. I haven't done any field investigations for a while. But, but I think there's more and more Canadians interested, and it, it's a show like yours is just going to help even more. Hey, Bob, do you think that because we are Canadian and we kind of have this laissez faire, lackadaisical attitude, about things where we just don't discuss anything too seriously unless it's NHL trade deadline day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, I, well, I mean, I, we're so connected to the United States and, and everything we watch from the media. Uh, I, I just think that, you know, a lot of Canadians sort of sit back and, and take it all in rather than want to just, uh, you know, offer their own opinion. Uh, except, except when it comes to hockey and, and uh, well, especially hockey and, and baseball with the Blue Jays uh, last year. You know, they own the, the radio in the summertime. But uh, uh, certainly, if it comes to hockey, Canadians, you know, talk shows just explode. Uh, oh, for sure. Um, so, um, but I mean, like even tonight. I mean, uh, I, I you know I was glued to the the CNN watching the American primary stuff, and and really have no vested interest in any of it. But I, it's like watching reality TV. It's, it's uh, fascinating. Do you find, though, that when you talk to Canadian people about these topics, they don't usually, they give that laugh and giggle, like with their Tim Hortons coffee, and yes, I'm throwing cliches out there about us right yeah. now, <laughs> but, but, they, but they always, always say, well, you know, there was this one time, I don't know what it was, and then the story comes right out. Yeah, I, I've had that on numerous occasions where, you know, people say, well, you don't really believe in this stuff. And, like, you know, I say, well, you know, how do you explain this? How do you explain that? And, you know, then they start thinking about it. And, uh, um, you know, invariably, many, many people have something in their background that they've experienced or can't explain. And, and they don't want to really admit the world we live in might not be the world they think it is. And, uh and I've had other people say that, you know, well, you know, just just complete uh, foolishness and, uh, you know, how can you believe such, you know, outlandish things. Uh, I've had even talk show, you know, hosts interviewing me and say, well, there's never been proof. We never had that one picture that shows, you know, uh, you know, this is 
this is a, an alien spacecraft. And, and yeah, I say, well, you know, there are a lot of pictures out there more and more that, that show something that people can't explain. Um, but, I mean, that may be part of the whole the whole thing that uh, we're not allowed to take the good pictures because the technology mm-hmm. just prevents us. Uh, I mean, even Project Blue Book, they, you know, at the end, uh, there was you know, more than 700 things, uh, sightings that they could not explain. And, uh, and that was basically an apologetic uh, part for the government. They, they explained everything as swamp gas and, and uh, Jupiter, things like that. Hey, Bob, what is your take then on the Canadian media as we focus on this? Because every time we have a UFO story, it always follows or begins with the X-Files theme. And then at the end of the story, whether it's on radio or whether it's on television, there's always some snide remark by the anchor who's extroing the story to really take every punch and every piece of legs that that story had on it right off the table. Yeah, I mean, uh, the the mainstream media has always done that except for very uh, unique circumstances. Uh, Other than that, they they just don't cover the thing. And when they do, it's always, uh, you know, the crazy old person in the country or or you really didn't see this and, and, you know, anchors. And they're not going to, you know, I don't think they'd, they'd really have the job they have if they, you know, somebody came out and said, you know, uh, I believe this guy 100% totally, and I don't care what the rest of my company thinks because, uh, you know, they wouldn't have a job. So, But the interesting thing is I wonder deep down inside if the owner of the publisher of that paper um, doesn't think, uh, you know, unofficially that there might be something to the story more than just a comedy show. I mean, CNN did a piece, I think, I think it was last summer where they sent a, or it might have been two summers ago, where they sent a reporter out to actually do a, a three-day field investigator uh, experience with MUFON, and uh, it started out as a serious thing, but, you know, halfway through, it was really made a joke, and it, it was sort of, uh, you know, I know the MUFON people were quite upset about it because they thought it was going to be handled a little more seriously, but, you know, Larry King, when he was on, he had, uh, you know, Several times he had some experts on, and uh, they made a pretty powerful case. But it's not something that you see every day in, uh, you know, the Vancouver papers, the Toronto papers, the New York Times. Uh, You know, a couple in 2013 when they had the Washington citizens' hearings down in Washington, that was held for an entire week, and and it got lots of publicity. But uh, and it sort of dies, and and it's it's a shame because. I, I, I read a study once that said every time there's a, a story in a newspaper about a UFO, um, circulation jumps sky high that day, and, and now with the, all the papers on the Internet, um, if there's a story about UFOs, everybody goes to it. So I think everybody is a closet uh, believer out there. Bob, how much credibility... I think you're a credible reporter. You have to be for 40 years with the Toronto Star. But how much of a of a beating, if any at all, did your reputation take when you started reporting and writing on ufology and the encounters people were having from your colleagues? Interesting question because um, I don't think I've ever had a negative email sent to me from anybody that I knew over the years. Um, in fact, uh, the ones that do send me things, they say, that was really interesting. I heard about you doing last you know, last night and uh, heard you on the radio. Uh, you, you know, that was fascinating. Uh, I, I've never had one person, you know, at least to my face or, or even on an internet or tweet, tweet, um, tweet um, uh, say anything bad. The only the only tweet I had that was really bad was I happened to be on coast to coast and uh, George asked me about what I thought of Donald Trump and and I said well it was uh, you know it's like watching a comedian but it's fascinating what what he's been able to do and I got a tweet from some American said you know typical establishment trying to you know shut down the only guy that's telling the truth out there and, and that was <laughs> quite funny but uh, but really I I mean I, I made a decision to leave the paper in 2013 I, I took a buyout and uh, 
before that, I had moved about uh, with my family about an hour outside of Toronto, and uh, and the commute was really getting to me because um, even though I was an hour's drive, if there was no rush hour, uh, when rush hour hit, and uh, depending where I had to go in the city, uh, it was like a four to five hour round trip every day. And I know that feeling. Yeah, and I just I just got tired of it. Um, I wasn't tired of writing, but uh, you know I. I thought this was a time, you know, they were offering a buyout, and and uh, I figured I could do some freelancing. Uh, never dreamed I'd be writing UFO books when I when I left, but uh, um, I, I, you know, I did some freelancing for sports still, and uh, a little bit of news, and I still do some freelancing for um, some of the uh, star-owned uh, community papers. So uh, my connection with UFOs hasn't hurt me there. Um, so I, I I don't really think it's hurt me at all. Uh, I think people, you know, I think more and more people are are opening their ears and their hearts and their eyes and their brains up to the possibilities. Uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, if you saw a ghost and you told somebody you saw a ghost, um, you know, they might think you're a little weird. Uh, uh, you say you saw a UFO, uh, you know, they might have the same feeling, but... Mm-hmm. I think eventually the the UFO community is going to be just like the, you know, the paranormal. The UFO is part of the paranormal, but uh, I think it's just going to be like seeing a seeing a ghost, seeing uh, you know um, something strange you can't explain. And uh, I think I think more and more people are are opening up to it. It's a worldwide phenomenon. There are so many conferences all over the world, and um, it's not just you know some little guy out in the country we have you know uh, ex-politicians we have astronauts uh, police officers government officials uh, scientists you know from all work walks of life firefighters and, and just the average joe i mean it's so not every single person is crazy and they're not all delusional um so and some of them have a lot to risk coming out but they do like you know the one thing we have right. in Canada, we have the highest-ranking uh, government official to ever come out with, Paul Hellyer. Yes. And, uh, you know, he's he's making a living now. It's, he's old, I think he's 85 now. And he's no, he's, ni- he's 92. He's of, yes, yes, he just had a first That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, and he's still kicking strong, and he's actually going to be at the uh, one of the guest speakers at the, one of the conferences that I'm part organizing this summer. So, um, um you know, everybody wants to see Paul Hellyer. Um, yeah, he's a, he's a name, and um, he has some things to say. And he may not be the the best person to have an experience, but he certainly hasn't backed down from what he believes is going on. I think the reason why Paul Hellyer is still going strong at 92 is because he's so hell bent angry on everything yeah. that is being covered up that he figures it, until another government official comes out and publicly states that UFOs are real and the cabal is real, yeah. that he's not going to die until that well, happens. You know, he's, he's fighting mad. And, uh, you know, I, uh, some of us thought maybe Hillary, Hillary might, uh, be on that path, particularly with John Podesta, uh, having those tweets saying that was the one regret he had before leaving office that the, the UFO uh, yes. wasn't revealed, and, and he's still, I'm still waiting for some uh, reporter and during these debates to ask her the question, but uh, nobody's had the guts to do it yet. You know what? We, we had Stephen Bassett from the Paradigm Research Group yes. on, mm-hmm. on February 12th, because February 13th was the one-year anniversary of that tweet right mm-hmm. after he left Obama. Mm-hmm. And the one thing that we asked, I asked him, and I'd be curious to get your opinion, so many people have been shut up by government officials when it comes to speaking publicly about UFOs. We've heard of threats from government officials, men in black, yeah. and my labs, and all sorts of horrendous things that the government has done to shut people up. But John Podesta seems to get a free pass to talk about it, or write forwards in books about the topic of ufology. How do you think, in your research, does he get away with that? Well, uh, one of the reasons he might be able to get away with it is that uh, the disclosure, uh, the people that are are holding all the keys to all this, 
I think they're trying to release bits and pieces of information, not everything at once, but just preparing uh, mankind for the ultimate disclosure. And and if, you know, if John Podesta is allowed to do this a little bit at a time, perhaps people will, you know, more people will be interested in it. Uh, I, I, I do not think disclosure is going to come all at once with one big giant press conference and, and announce everything that uh, they've been hiding for all these years. Uh, but I do think bits and pieces are leaking out, and John Podesta seems to be, you know, one of the people to do it and, and is really nudging Hillary to do it at every chance he gets. Um, but I think in this election year, uh, if Hillary was to come out uh, tomorrow and, and announce that she believes in UFOs and they're here, I think there'd be a segment of the population that would consider her to be a complete lunatic and a quack, and that would end her presidency. Uh, and I can't imagine what Donald Trump would do to that if, uh, if, if she was able to do that. So I think if it's going to come out, uh, it, and in, it, what little it will come out, if it does come out, will happen long after Hillary gets elected if she does become president. Um, but Podesta is an interesting character because uh, he keeps having these little nudges here and there, and, mm-hmm. and uh, he's either he's part of the been, been read into the riot act from the from the group above him and said this is what you can do but you can't do any further, uh, or he's just going out of his own believing that he has protection um, is another story. Do you do you see another Canadian politician? out there right now who would step up the way Paul Hellyer did? Um, no, not right now. Um, um, because I really think in the in the overview of, of governments, um, I really don't think Canada matters a lot. Uh, you know, if, if I think if, if the United States is the number one government in the world uh, that knows everything, um, they only give Canadians as little as possible, uh, even though they share some military bases and, and secrets like that. I, I, I just can't see, uh, you know, I can't see Justin Trudeau coming out and, and doing it. Uh, and I, you know, um, I, I just don't think there's anybody that would risk their reputation to do it while they're still sitting in office. They'd have to mm-hmm. be out of office for a while. And as Paul Hellier will tell you, he, uh, he didn't know anything, uh, when he was in office, uh, UFO stuff would cross his desk, and he just would dismiss it, and and, and uh, never really had the time, and nobody seemed to be, uh, you know, con- too concerned about it as being something that was of any national interest. Uh, mm-hmm. um, but it wouldn't surprise me that somewhere in some back room there is still a, a UFO, uh, at least an office somewhere uh, that isn't called that, but they they investigate other things. Um, uh, you know, in, in Great Britain, they've come out and said they have an office, and Nick Pope was part of that for a little while, and and they have it in Russia, and they have it in a lot of in France in particular, and I think uh, Brussels has it, and, and certainly a lot of the countries in South America have it. But Canada, I just think, is not really a major player on the world stage uh, at this point. We have had crashes here before. Shag mm-hmm. Harbor being the most famous, that would be yeah. That's, I think that that's one that nobody can explain. Uh, the Shag Harbor one, we had we had eyewitnesses, and and it just sort of vanished, disappeared. Mm-hmm. What do you think about that crash then, Bob, or supposed crash that happened in Lake Winnipeg about a year ago? Yeah, I don't know about that one. Uh, I, I heard so many conflicting stories about that. You know that, that it did happen, that it didn't happen, that it that it was a cover up, that it was nothing, and and it's never really been investigated. Uh, um, you know, I don't think uh, we didn't have anybody uh, up in that area to even look at it when I was with Lufon, and I and I don't really think Grant Cameron um, did anything from his point because he he's in another direction, like like myself, he deals with. Uh, you know, more of the the inside uh, look at UFOs rather than lights in the sky and things like that. Um, but, um, you know, again, if, if it did happen, it, it might have been, you know, uh, one of ours, 
one of our mm-hmm. crops, and they, it was just covered up militarily. Or, or when I mean ours, I mean the United States that was flying, and, and it crashed, and then it was quickly, you know, covered up, and, which has happened in the past, you know, 40, 50 decades, I'm sure, by, by many people who have who've come forward as insiders to say that it was something that's regularly happened in, in our history. We are talking with author Bob Mitchell tonight on Space Out Radio, his latest book, What If? Close Encounters of the Unusual Kind. You can find it on Amazon right now. We are going to hop out for our first break. When we come back, we're going to find out more about why Bob got into studying UFOs. You're listening to Space Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott. We'll be back after this break. This is Patrick Webster-Small, and I'm going to bring you the Webster Phenomena right here on Space Out Radio, Monday night at 8 p.m. Pacific Time. Every week, I'm going to bring you the freshest information on the globe. I'm bringing you guys the truth. Extraterrestrials in the sky. Prophecy. Chemtrails. Rainbow Spot. The Seventh Angel. Biblical Skies. Ancient Gods. Ghosts. Spirits. See it. Hear it. So let's do this every Monday night. I'll see you back here at 8 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, how can you afford not to get one? Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com for mind, body, and spirit. And expect a miracle. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? Did you know that Spaced Out Radio is live seven days a week? This is Jim Tyson, host of Spaced Out Weekend. You can listen to my show, Spaced Out Weekend, every Saturday and Sunday night starting at 1 a.m. Eastern, 10 p.m. Pacific. On Spaced Out Weekend, we like to delve into the paranormal, even the newest technologies that have enhanced modern-day ghost hunting. And sometimes, we'll get a little creative and dabble into the crypto world, UFOs, and much, much more. So tune in at www.spacedoutradio.com on the weekends and listen to me, Jim Tyson, on Spaced Out Weekend. Hi there, this is Jolene with Rivula Reiki and Reading, and I want you to relax. Let me help you chill out and get in touch with your body, mind, and soul. In this busy world, sometimes we need to let go, and this is where I can help. Visit my website, rivuletrnr.wix.com forward slash rivuletrnr, or my Facebook page, rivuletrnr, to set up an appointment for relaxation, Reiki, or readings, no matter where you are. Spaced Out Radio listeners will also receive 10% off their first visit. It's time for you to make time for you. The Spaced Out Radio Network can be found at spacedoutradio.com. Hi there, this is Dave Scott. Here you can join the latest on our weekly shows and news from around the world involving UFOs, cover-ups, cryptids, ghosts, and more. Read articles from our very talented staff and check out our weekly tarot card reading from psychic Catherine. You can also sign up for free on our forum and tell us about your experiences. SpacedOutRadio.com. Always live, always interactive. Ready to find out what's flying up in the sky? Me too. Hi there, this is Rich Giordano. Please join me every Sunday night at 7 for the AZ UFO Show. It's a fast and compelling two-hour show on UFOs, extraterrestrials, conspiracy theories, and much more. Every week we will have great guests and great topics to try and answer the ultimate question, are we alone in this universe or not? So tune in to the AZ UFO Show with me, Rich Giordano, right here on the Spaced Out Radio Network at spacedoutradio.com. Would you like to connect with Dave and his guests? Learn more at spacedoutradio.com for the latest news, features, photos, and articles. Spacedoutradio.com is where you can stay up to date 
on what's happening around the world and up in the stars. And now, back to Dave Scott. Welcome back to the second half hour of Space Out Radio tonight. Thank you so much for tuning in, especially if you're in the Space Out Radio chat room at Paranormal End of the Night or Paranormal Forum. You guys are great. Thank you for being with us tonight. Tomorrow night on the show, we're going to continue with the ET experience. Contactee C.J. Friesman will be our guest tomorrow night on Spaced Out Radio. Hey, if you want to follow us on social media, you can do so on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. On Facebook, Spaced Out Radio Show, you can give our page a like. On Instagram, you can follow me at Dave Scott, S-O-R. Our new YouTube channel is Spaced Out Radio Show. And, of course, our website is spacedoutradio.com. Check it out in about a week. We're updating absolutely everything. It's going to look really, really awesome. I hope you check it out. Tonight we are talking UFOs with author Bob Mitchell. His latest book, What If? Close Encounters of the Unusual Kind. Bob, thank you so much for joining us tonight. My pleasure. I'm curious, and I've been asked this from Marlena in the Space Out Radio chat room. Have you personally had any experiences? And if not, what drew you to covering and writing about UFOs? Uh, I can give you answers to both of those. Um, and uh, the answers to both questions aren't connected in any way. So let me get the, the first one out of, out of the way first. Uh, the the experience that I had, um, and I'm still not sure if it was an experience or not. Um, and one day I think I probably will go under regressive hypnotism just to, just to satisfy my mind. But it was about 10 years ago. And my, we lived in a place called Oakville, Ontario, uh, which is uh, just outside of Toronto. And um, I had come home from work in usual time. And my wife at the time worked at uh, at a assisted living, a senior assisted living center. So she worked the late shift, and um, she was home about midnight. And uh, we talked briefly around midnight, and then uh, she was going off the walk and some TV and uh, I, I went to bed and uh, um, I was a pretty, always a pretty light sleeper. Like any, any noise, anything would wake me up. And I, I probably, uh, from the time we had kids, to, to even almost till today, you know, I, I, I rarely sleep, you know, eight straight hours. I'm always, you know, waking up in the middle of the night and then trying to get back to sleep. So um, that was the way I slept back then. So, <clears throat> Somehow in the middle of the night, around 3 o'clock in the morning, we think it is, my wife comes into the bedroom, wakes me up and says, um, you, you got to look outside and, and you, you got to see what the clouds are doing. And there's, there's this tremendous wind and all the garbage cans are flying. Down. And um, so I remember her coming in and waking me up. Um, I do not remember going to the window and looking out the window as she says I did. And, and when we did, she says she pointed up into the cloud, and it, lo- it looked like the clouds had a hole punched through them, uh, a light punched right through them. Um, again, I have no memory of this, but she says we looked out the window for this for quite some time. And then um, because the, everything was going around the house, she went out the front door to pick up the garbage cans, and I went out the back door to get the patio f- or furniture. And um, now this should have been pitch black. And I remember stepping out into the patio and feeling like it was as bright as day out there. Um, the strange thing is I never looked up. I just continued to get all the patio furniture, and I remember feeling as if there was a, like I was Dorothy in, in The Wizard of Oz. There was this wind all around me, but it wasn't cold. It wasn't hot. Uh, it was just wind everywhere, and I picked up all the patio furniture, got it all straight away. Um, my wife says she came in the backyard, asked me if I needed any help. And I sort of remember her doing that. And I clearly remember picking up all the furniture. And then we came inside and shut the doors. And um, she says I, we sat down and talked about it. I have no memory of sitting down and talking about it. And then I, I remember going back to bed as if nothing had happened. And, and then uh, waking up the next morning thinking that I, and part of me thought I had this strange dream. 
And so I, when I saw her that day, I said, did, did we get up in the middle of the night and go out and pick up all the furniture? She says, yeah, it happened. And um, and we just didn't talk about it again after that. It was like it was something that happened, but that was it. And it wasn't until uh, years later that she mentioned to me that when I was outside that picking up the furniture, she saw me uh, sort of engulfed in a, in a blue light. Um People that I've talked to, a lot of experiencers, they always talk about a blue light taking them somewhere. Um, I have no memory of them taking them somewhere. My wife says I didn't go anywhere. Um, um, and I have to believe her because she, she wasn't asleep. Um, and till this day, I don't know what it was. But I know the next morning when I talked to neighbors, they didn't know what I was talking about. They didn't experience any wind or storm or anything like that. And uh, so... It's a strange thing. Um, I just don't know what happened that night. Now, um, that did not get me interested in, in, in writing about it. Uh, the strange thing was that um, I had a passing interest in UFOs, I think, for, for most of my adult life. Uh, and so did my wife. We'd watch, you know, uh, some science fiction shows on TV um, um, and, and movies that came on and uh and documentaries at any time there was about UFOs, um, and we were interested in them, um, but not to the point where, uh, you know, our, my life was taken over by it, and certainly not to the point where, you know, I even thought about the incident that happened to us in, in Oakville. But um, I always thought that while when I was writing uh, the true crime books and then eventually moving into sports, uh, that one day I'd like to, you know, do a story on a UFO. I'd, I'd love to be able to be sent out on an assignment where there was, a, you know, UFO sightings or somebody had seen something or a crash. And, of course, that never happened working for you know, the largest paper in Canada. And, and certainly I, I don't even recall ever um, reading much about UFOs in the, in the Toronto Star or any Toronto paper, for that matter, uh, when I was an active journalist. Um, there would, might have been some short, you know, two-inch stories out of the United States, but certainly not nothing to write home about in, in Canada. Um, so when I when I finally left the paper, um, uh, one day I was you know doing some freelancing, and I and I thought, well, we need to you know find a, a UFO investigator uh, in the area we're living in now, um, because Hangar One had been in its first year on on TV when I left. Uh, the star, and, and for people who are not sure what that is, that's MUFON's television show about uh, all things alien and UFO uh, conspiracy. So I thought, well, let's, you know, I'll call up some and I'll do a local story on some local guy from local paper. So um, I called MUFON and called their head office in California, and I said, listen, uh, can you put me in touch with somebody in southern Ontario that was... Uh, you know, field investigator, and they said, oh, yeah, no problem. So the next thing I know, they, they put me in touch with uh, Stu Bundy, who was the Ontario director of MUFON, and, and the name rang a bell to me, but I couldn't place it uh, right away. But then uh, I phoned him, and uh, uh, we we got to talking, and I realized that Stu Bundy uh, was a former sports announcer for uh, CTV. And and my first go-around in sports in the in – the, uh, Late seventies, early eighties, uh, he was he was one of the sports announcers that I, I regularly ran into. Um, so we talk, got to talking, and it turns out there there was nobody in Southern Ontario uh, part of Mufon except Stu, and he was everything. He was the you know chief bottle washer and investigator, and and because he was a one man band, he really didn't have the time to investigate uh, a lot of things. So we had lunch and. Uh, before I knew it, uh, I joined MUFON, became a field investigator, and then actually became the person I was going to write about. So Interesting. So I never did write the story for anybody about myself, um, but that led to uh, us forming, uh, after we went to Philadelphia, we actually drove down together to Philadelphia to attend the, uh, the conference, and uh, we thought, well, let's see if there's any interest in uh, the Brantford, where I live now, and so... Um, a couple months later, we, I, I put an ad in the new, local newspaper. Uh, actually, I wrote a news release uh, saying that we were going to have a 
a Brantford chapter of MUFON and explain what it was, and we're looking for people to sign up and tell their stories about if they have any. Uh, we found a coffee shop that will let us uh, hold the thing for free, and uh, we figured maybe seven, ten people might show up, and uh, lo and behold, uh, 75 people showed up for that first meeting. And, no kidding. Uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't fit them all in. Um, they were all fascinated, and uh, I, I, I was uh, standing there and talking about some of the things that I had heard and some of the things that Lufon was doing, and I, and I happened to mention that uh, uh, one of the things that what people had told me was that the aliens had come through their wall mysteriously and appeared in their bedroom. And when I said that, there was this man at the back of the room that was just having an apoplectic fit. I mean, he was crying and waving his hands, and and I didn't know what was going on. And uh, when it was all over, he came up to me and said that it happened to him, you know, 20 years ago. He's been waiting to tell somebody the story because nobody will believe him. And then... Next thing I knew, I had another person come up to me and wanted to meet me, you know, afterwards and, and tell me the story. And uh, before long, I had uh, more than enough stories for my first book, <laughs> and uh, just from the local people. And I was quite amazed. And, and the one thing that really amazed me about everything was that how much these people had kept these secrets hidden for most of their adult life. Uh, they were all in their fifties and sixties, and it was like you know, they had been terrified to let anybody know that this had happened to them. And finally, they had somebody who was willing to listen to them and not just ridicule them right off the bat. And uh, I became almost like a psychologist to many people there. And, and, and I just listened and listened. And, uh, and a lot of them had tears in their eyes and, and just, you know, so thankful that I, I had been there and we had met. And and afterwards, I can tell you, after some of them ended up in my uh, my second book, Intrusion, the Alien Encounters, and um, the ones I used, uh, uh, every single one of them, after they uh, had told me their story o- over several weeks of interviews, uh, they all felt a tremendous burden had been lifted off their shoulders, and they all became almost new people. I mean, I could see personality changes in them from the time they started talking to me to the time uh, uh, they finished. Uh, it was an incredible transformation, and and it, this is just a snapshot of the people that are out there. Uh, I think it really is important for people that have had an experience to tell somebody they can trust, tell somebody that they can, you know, uh, unburden themselves because if they don't, they're going to drive themselves nuts. I think. We are talking with author Bob Mitchell tonight on Spaced Out Radio. His latest book can be found on Amazon. What if? Close Encounters of the Unusual Kind. When you are investigating these stories, and we're getting a lot of questions coming in from the paranormal end of the night right now for you, what are some of the best stories that you think are untapped? Because down in the States, we've all heard of Benny and Barney Hill. We've all heard of Roswell. We've all heard of Travis Walton with Fire in the Sky. What about Canada? What would Canada's version of those incidents be that you have personally investigated? Oh, well, I mean, the thing that I found is that um, a lot of them are completely different than than the kind of experience that we all hear about. I mean, I just want to step back for a second. Uh, Before I started interviewing people that had claimed they had experiences of, of these otherworldly beings. Um, I really thought, um, you know, Betty and Barney Hill, Travis Walton, and maybe a couple of others were the only ones in the entire world that have ever had these experiences. I I never, ever knew how widespread this was. In fact, I'm I'm told now that there are a million people in the United States alone that believe they've had some encounters. Um, But I really thought, you know, it was such a small small group of the population and it turns out it's not. It's, it's far more than any of us ever ever dreamed. Um, one of the most disturbing cases that, that I've ever heard of in Canada and I haven't written about it yet because uh, halfway through our interviews the woman just couldn't. She wanted to meet me in person and she didn't want to do it over the phone or Facebook anymore and she lived about 500 uh, miles from me so um, we've never actually got together 
so I haven't included her story in any book, but I can tell you a bit about her story. And, uh, I, I, you know, I go into this believing that they believe this happened to them. Um, and I it, do not believe they're making it up. So I believe that, uh, you know, either they have some kind of psychological problem or this really happened to them. And uh, after what I've been told from a lot of other people, I, I really don't have any doubts anymore that it didn't happen. Um, but anyways, her, I would, if I was writing her story, I would call her story the horror factory. And, and the reason I, I would call that is that um, it not only happened to her, it happened to her daughter. And uh, uh, not as a young daughter, but, you know, her daughter's in her 20s now, and I think the, this woman's in her 50s. And um, she lives in northern Ontario. And uh, the essentially is that uh, over a, a, a period of, of, I think, a couple of years in the 1980s, um, they would be in their house that they lived in and the daughter's room was, uh, she was living still with the mother and the daughter's room was across the hall from the mother. And the mother would wake up screaming in the middle of the night and be literally dragged out of her bed by small being, small hooded beings with gnarly arms that you would, I guess, um, consider what a gray would have with the long fingers. But yes. this was not a gray. This was a, a different being. And I must tell you, she is not the only one that's told me about these hooded beings. Uh, I've had at least half a dozen people who don't know each other have told me about this hooded being. And and she would be dragged out of this bedroom uh, by three or four of them down the stairs and just screaming. And they would also go into her daughter's room and they would grab her too and just screaming out the door. And... Um, there were these blackouts after shortly after this happened, and again, blackouts are very uh, common to almost every uh, experiencer that I've uh, interviewed. Uh, at some point during their experience, there is always blackness, and then they go on to something else. So the blackness wasn't uh, unusual. When she was telling me this, it was unusual for me hearing her. She was one of the first people that I talked to a couple of years ago. And when she when they got to where they were, it appeared to both of them that uh, they were not in a spaceship, but they were in some underground factory and with conveyor belts. And uh, um, there were these little hooded beings there. Uh, there were also uh, military-type people that looked just like you and I, only with military uniforms. And there was a, a, a reptilian type creature uh, there as well. Um, and there was a line of humans, just like her, on this conveyor belt. And as the conveyor belt was going down, there were uh, basically animals on this conveyor belt. And all the humans had knives. And as the animals came down, they had to stab these animals. And it was a long conveyor belt and lots of blood and lots of stabbing and... Uh, this woman and her daughter were very animal lovers, and this actually horrified them and made them sick to their stomach. That, but they had no control. They, they, it was as if that their mind wasn't their own mind, and they just had to keep stabbing these animals. And when that was over, um, you know, they found themselves back in their bed again. And this would happen repeatedly several times a week. Until one time when it happened, um, it wasn't animals anymore. It was basically human body parts that were coming down this line of a conveyor belt. And uh, that made it even horrifying to her. But, but, but somehow these human body parts, wherever they were coming from, they were already killed and dismembered. Um, I've had nobody ever tell me that story, anything close to that story. Um, and she says that's only part of her horrendous, uh, you know, life that she and her daughter has lived. So eventually, I'm hoping to contact her again uh, because I uh, not only am I fascinated by it, I I, I want to hear more about what uh, what these two people have gone through. And again, no I, I've never heard anybody else 
have ever gone through that. I don't think there's any stories on the Internet. <laughs> that. Um, the interesting thing is, though, that a lot of people who do have uh, in, incarnation, not incarnations, um, experiences, some of them will tell you that they do find themselves at some point in an underground facility, and at some point they do see military people that are very human-looking. Uh, along with various different alien creatures. Um, this woman's never seen a gray, but she did see a couple of reptoids who seemed to be in control but not interacting. And there was really nobody uh, forcing them physically to do this. They were all standing around watching. Um, so that in itself is a very remarkable story. That is just probably one of the most disgusting stories I have ever heard in regards to alien abduction. Me too. Me too. Um, but unfortunately, it's not, or fortunately, it depends on how you look at it, it's not in any of my books yet. But uh, there, um, there is some fascinating stories in, in, in both of my books uh, that are out mm-hmm. right now. Um, and I'm pleased uh, to talk about them. And, uh, and Absolutely. And I don't know how you want to go about it, but... Uh, you can ask the questions and well, well I, uh, unless you want me to give you a, a different different version of a story that uh, I <laughs> well, you know what I'll get into your other books because we're close to a, a break here in about five minutes, and we'll get to your other books right after the break, but I'm curious because I've talked to a lot of people, Canadian people in regards to their own personal alien abductions or contact. I personally have had contact. Yes, and, I'd love to hear about yours. And for most part, barring one or two stories, I find that most Canadian people are having quite pleasant contact experiences. Have you noticed that as well, or have you noticed it go the other way, more so on the East Coast compared to West Coast? Huh. East Coast, West Coast. Well, um, most of the people that I've dealt with are on the East Coast, so I have to qualify that. Um, I will say um, even the ones that have had majority pleasant experience, some of the experiences are not so pleasant. Uh, but uh, a lot of them do not have the kind of horrifying, horrific um experience that the, the the story I just previously told you. Uh, and um, why that is, I'm not sure, because I think you're right. I mean, a, a lot of the things that you hear from the United States are always, you know, mm-hmm. horrible experiments on them. And yes. I, I have heard that from some of the people in my books, too. But uh, the people in my books have also opened up an entirely other uh, realm of... Uh, of uh, Abduction, I'd say. Right. That um, that is a whole different ball game, I think. Uh, particularly when it comes to a different species called the insectoid, the mantis. <laughs> well, here's my theory, and I was wondering your opinion on this because this is the first time I'm going to ask a fellow Canadian about this. Okay. I have a personal theory that the reason why most Canadian abductees or contactees have a pleasant or not so violent encounter has to do with the fact that we as Canada never signed a deal with extraterrestrials, which was humans for technology. Hmm. I'm curious what your opinion would that on that would be. Well, I'm, I'm, uh, I can tell you that, if such a deal was signed, I have been told that Canada wasn't part of it. So that part, you are, you are absolutely true in that. Um, but I believe that deals were signed, and not once, not twice, but uh, if you believe Laura Eisenhower, uh, the great yes. grand leader of uh, Dwight, she says it's, they're being re-signed every 10 years, dating back to 1940s with, with Roosevelt. Uh, but Canada has never been part of it. Um, so um, that's a good theory. 
Um, on the other hand, uh, if I play devil's advocate here, I have also been told that um, if a, a race is so much technically advanced than we are and so superior in everything, that they really wouldn't need a deal to do anything. They would just come and take us anyways. And so whether we signed a deal or not, uh, Canadians would be fair game as anybody else. Uh, unless aliens really are a noble species and when they sign an agreement, they they try to stick to it. But well, and, and from what the Canadians have not been part of it as far as I know. No, and from what I have heard on that, Bob, is the fact that – and I've had Laura Eisenhower say on this show exactly what you had said as well. And one of the things that I have learned in putting all of this theory, this theory together, and it's my own theory, there's nothing scientific about it, but if you look where there were other species around that are apparently – saying, you know, yes, no on what happens on Earth because they want to see us prosper, it then makes sense that you would have to cut a deal with a government in order to take the people because you're right, they do have the technology to do whatever they want to us. They could annihilate us, but they yeah. don't. So if they are all benevolent beings, then they would probably agree to this agreement. Um, but I'm not sure they're all benevolent. And uh, the ones that aren't uh, playing by the rules are the ones we have to really worry about, I think. But again, sure. they would, you think they would just take and pick and choose whatever they want. But um, maybe they got enough in the, in the state. <laughs> I, don't know. I have no idea. All I know yeah. is I'm pretty glad to be up here. Bob, I'm going to get you to hold on. We are going to go to our break here at the top of the hour. We are talking with author Bob Mitchell. You can find any of his books on Amazon.com, including his newest book, What If? Close Encounters of the Unusual Kind. We're going to get more to your questions and more questions about ufology and the experiences people are having with Bob right after this. The Phoenix Lights, Roswell, secret military aircraft, flying saucers. Let's check out the sky together. Hi, this is Rich Giordano, host of the AZ UFO Show right here on the Spaced Out Radio Network. Every Sunday night at 7, we hit the airwaves to talk about the phenomenon of unidentified flying objects and more. We want to hear your stories. Maybe you've seen what many others have seen. Only one way to find out, the AZ UFO Show on Sunday nights on the Spaced Out Radio Network on spacedoutradio.com. Hi there, this is James Tyson, host of Spaced Out Weekends. And I know you're enjoying tonight's show with Dave Scott on Spaced Out Radio. I just wanted to remind you that Spaced Out Radio continues on the weekends with me. On Spaced Out Weekend, we hit the airwaves at www.spacedoutradio.com starting at 10 p.m. Pacific, 1 a.m. Eastern. We have great guests with interesting chats regarding all things paranormal, supernatural, cryptozoological, and much, much more. So tune in to Spaced Out Weekend and give us a listen. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, how can you afford not to get one? Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com for mind, body, and spirit. And expect a miracle. Need a break but don't have the time? Tired of life's running around? Hi, this is Jolene from Rivulet Relaxation and Readings. Let me help you in your time of need. From Reiki to Realm Readings, I can help provide you therapy for your mind, body, and soul. Check out my website at rivuletrnr.wix.com forward slash rivuletrnr. And if you're a listener of Spaced Out Radio, receive 10% off your first session. Rivulet Relaxation and Ratings. And don't forget to give my Facebook page a like. It's time for you to make some important time for you. The Spaced Out Radio Network can be found at spacedoutradio.com. Hi there, this is Dave Scott. Here you can join the latest on our weekly shows and news from around the world involving UFOs, cover-ups, cryptids, ghosts, and more. Read articles from our very talented staff and check out our weekly tarot card reading from psychic Catherine. 
You can also sign up for free on our forum and tell us about your experiences. SpacedOutRadio.com. Always live, always interactive. The Webster Phenomena airs on Spaced Out Radio on Monday night at 8 p.m. Pacific Time. I'm your host, Patrick Webster Small, and I discovered extraterrestrials in the atmosphere, which led me to more discoveries developing the Webster Phenomena, which is the occurrence of extraterrestrials throughout nature. I will explain the Webster Phenomena and all my recent discoveries every Monday night at 8 p.m. Pacific Time, right here on Spaced Out Radio. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? Want to call in to Space Out Radio? You can. 1-607-203-5344. You can tweet us at Spaced Out Radio or send us a message on Facebook at Spaced Out Radio. And now, back to the show, here's Dave Scott. For the rest of the story. And we're back on Space Out Radio tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Tomorrow night, our guest will be CJ Friesman. We'll be talking ET contact tomorrow night on Space Out Radio. If you want to follow us on Twitter, you can do so at Space Out Radio. You can give our Facebook page a like, Space Out Radio Show. You can also ask to join our private Space Out Radio group. On Instagram, you can follow me at Dave Scott, S O R. And our website is spacedoutradio.com. Stay tuned. We are going to be revamping the entire thing very, very shortly. It's going to look great. Tonight we are talking with author Bob Mitchell. He is a 40-year journalist. He is now an author of some incredible books that you can find on Amazon, including The Incident at Pleasant Ridge, which we're going to get into, and his latest book, What If? Close Encounters of the Unusual Kind. Bob, what made you write What If? Well, I last summer I uh, was one of the 24 guest speakers at uh, a conference called the Alien Cosmic Expo in Brantford, Ontario. And we're, we're having it again uh, this uh, summer, and if we have time near the end of the show, I'd like to take a few minutes to tell people what's all happening again this year. But um, I actually was the opening act. Uh, so to speak, for that uh, conference. And and I, I remember standing up on the stage and uh, on the Friday morning and, and wasn't sure what I was going to say. And then for some reason it just sort of hit me that that uh, everybody that was attending this conference were really going to be on uh, an unusual and incredible journey of discovery uh, because we, we had so many really fascinating guests and, and Grant Cameron was one of them, Stanton Friedman was one of them, and so we were going to hear about Roswell. We were going to hear about what the presidents know. And Len Caston, who I'm not sure your viewers know, but he wrote a book uh, called uh, Secrets of uh, Serpo. And uh, what his book is about is is that uh, he had insider information that that basically said that in, in, in the 1960s, during the President Kennedy's era, um, he authorized uh, an interstellar uh, exchange with a group of beings called Ebens, and and 13 astronauts and scientists went to this planet, lived there for 13 years, and, and then came back, and, and they went on another trip. So it occurred to me that all these people were going to, you know, present you know incredible stories that uh, most of the people had never heard before, and, and I just thought, well. You know, I'm I'm going to give them a, a few stories too about people that have had incredible experiences, and and uh, I I really believe that 
they believe they've had experiences. But it occurred to me that, well, well, what if one of the people, only one of the 24 people that we're talking about that we're going to give lectures actually were talking about something that was true? Uh, And then I thought, well, what if two or three really were true? Or or what if five or six were true? And, And I got thinking that if even if one person was telling the truth, it would mean that the world we live in really isn't the world most of us think it is, that it's something completely different, that uh, aliens do exist, they have been interacting with uh, mankind for many years, and that the government's been covering this up. And I thought that would be uh, such a game changer. It would change people's lives. And uh, so that's where this title came from, that I thought, well, I'm going to write a book about alien experiences and try to get... uh, more and different experiences I wrote in my other book, uh, Alien, uh, Intrusion, Alien Encounters. I wanted all completely different experiences that provided a completely different book that no one had ever heard before. And and I did. I mean, I found eight people that had all very, di- very different experiences, uh, some of them that uh, no one's ever heard, even thought about before. And, and it actually... Um, change the way I kind of look at um, what alien abductions really are in some cases. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it may not be a physical uh, abduction, and, and maybe I can we'll expand on that uh, if you want. Sure. Um, it, 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 <coughs> what I've come to believe from talking to a lot of uh, people on the subject is that um, we are, mankind really is a fourth dimensional being trapped in a third dimensional world. And many of the beings that people are seeing, they're actually seeing them and experiencing these uh, interactions in a fourth dimensional world. And the way they do get to see it is through dreamlike states uh, and astral projection, astral traveling. That, that when you dream, you actually are dreaming in a fourth dimension. You're not dreaming in the, in the third physical dimension that we live in every day. And so, because so, so many people have, have told me that their experiences begin while they're in bed, and then they're suddenly, you know, they feel themselves being taken up through the ceiling of their house and into a spaceship or somewhere else. And, you know, it's one thing to believe in aliens, but it's another thing to believe that a physical body can go through a roof of a house. Uh, bricks and, and, and do that with, without some tremendous ability on the aliens to, uh, you know, create different matter. Now, I'm not saying they can't do that with their technology, but to me, I think what's happening is that the, that the alien experience, in most cases, involves the being from a fourth dimensional world able to take you out of your body and take you somewhere where you have this experience. And people will ask me, well, how how do they experience the pain uh, if they're under, you know, going uh, experiments? And I say, well, if you know somebody who's lost a limb, uh, there's these phantom pains. Your mind tells you that your hand is still there, even though it's not. And I think that's what's happening in these experiences, that your consciousness is somewhere else. And the brain is so strong that you can actually think that you've got a physical body there but you're not. And, and so they somehow are able to take your consciousness and do experiments through your mind on your body that it really isn't there. Uh, but the pain is real from your mind. And then you black out, you're back in your body again, and in some cases there's a scar because there's a physical scar that somehow gets into your body, but you don't. your body is not physically there because so many... Uh, abductions involve people asleep in bed with their partner or their kids or their homes. And none of these people ever mention that they ever leave. Yet in their mind, they have actually physically left. And so I, I, I'm more and more believing that abductions, in for most cases, not all, because I think some of them are taking place in the physical world, um, but most of the beings that are involved in things on Earth uh, our fourth dimensional beings, and that's where things are happening. Very interesting indeed. I, I never would have put the fourth dimensional part together on that. 
I do have some questions from the Space Out Radio listenership that I do want to get to, and I want to get back to the fourth dimensional stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Joe is asking, from an American standpoint, does Canada now have more UFO sightings than Bigfoot sightings? Because before, everybody was seeing Bigfoot. Now we seem to be transitioned to more UFOs. Um, I would say we've always had more UFO sightings, except Bigfoot is so the flavor of the day a lot of times. Um, I, I've never spoken to anybody that's had a Bigfoot sighting, but um, and I, I think Bigfoots are pretty, uh, you know, a valid thing in the states too. I mean, they they talk about in the Pacific Northwest all the time seeing it, and I think in uh, Northern California and also in in Pennsylvania somewhere, I, I think they do it. So I wouldn't say it's just a, a Canadian thing, but uh, you know, the Pacific Northwest is has been a hotbed, and um, but I can honestly say I don't think there's ever been a Sasquatch or a Bigfoot sighting in Ontario, at least none that I know of. So I would say that um, there's still more UFO sightings than Bigfoot. Although some people say Bigfoot is part of an alien race, and I'm not so sure about that. Yeah, that's a whole different ball game for a whole different other night on that topic. Okay. Yeah. That's for sure. So when you are investigating this fourth kind or this fourth dimension that that is going through, how do you think then people are getting into the spaceships if they're able to take us through walls, cement, brick, mortar, whatever it is, how do you think we get into the spaceships then? Well, if they are able to take us through that, because I think even when we're in the spaceships, I mean, when you end up talking to experiencers and you talk to them a long time, um, they all they all are seeing this in their mind. They, they, they believe they're physically there, but the brain is so strong that even the spaceship thing is that they are, they may physically, their consciousness is in the spaceship, put it that way, rather than their body. But the, it's, the mind is so strong that they think they're physically there, that they're walking around, um, but they may not be. Um, again, some of them are, and, and I think more and more I'm leaning to the effect that the, the ones that are physically taken, and I don't think they're taken up through the roof of their house. I think they're they're abducted from outside. Uh, I believe more and more of those are actually being taken by uh, the military, uh, pretending right. to be pretending to be aliens and and uh, or maybe in cahoots with a, a species. But I think the real um, the stuff that starts with dreams um, are actually fourth dimensional um, experiences. And I think if you if you once you start start having them like repeatedly, your mind actually becomes more and more relaxed and becomes more of a right. I mean, that's the thing, and as you said, a lot of people have pleasant experiences. Uh, uh, I've had several different people tell me that while they are uh, under the control of an alien species and and really not liking what they are experiencing originally. Mm-hmm. Um, the phrase comes to mind all the time that you've agreed to this, and this is just a, a stage mm-hmm. on your process. And right, uh, agreeing to this brings an entire other uh, possibility. And, and and in the book, I talk about reincarnation too. And, right. Um, and I have a really good story about that. If you want to, let me to tell the listeners about that. Sure, why don't we get into that right now, because I, I do have a comment in regards to what you had just said as well, but let's hear about the reincarnation first. Okay. Um, there's a, a, a producer, director named uh, Satya Anand, and uh, that's his uh, actual Buddhist name. Um, he has a, a professional name he uses, but uh, he's involved with a big project right now trying to pitch... Uh, I'm getting a multi-million dollar deal going, and uh, we agreed that it might not be the best thing to uh, have his real name mentioned right now in case the people going to give him the money might change their mind if uh, they didn't believe in some of the things he believes. So, but this is an absolute uh, true story, and everybody involved in it is true. So he, uh, he spent 
about 29 years uh, in Tibet, learning all about the, uh, you know, the meditation and uh, reincarnation from one of the, the ascended, not ascended masters, but one of the, they call them enlightened masters, which is a, uh, it's a swami, basically, but uh, one of the high-ranking swamis in Tibet. And so he was very adept at astral traveling and is one of these people that can control it now and and he can actually leave his body when he wants to leave his body. And um, one day he's uh, about, I think it was 2010, he had some friends over in his Toronto condo and uh, they were on the balcony and uh, it was summertime and, and he wanted to just go in and have a, a power meditation just uh, for a few minutes in, in uh, the bedroom. So he had been used to leaving his body, so he knew what that experience was like. And, and people who who have uh, frequently uh, asked for travel will tell you that when you leave your body, again, it's your consciousness that's leaving. And so you don't, if you look down, you don't physically see a hand or a body. You just sort of have an eye that is not really an eye, but you see 360 degrees around. And mm-hmm. there's a sense of flying, and, and you can control where you're going, basically. But you never physically see yourself. In this instance, uh, suddenly he found himself shot out of his body like a cannon. And the next thing he knows, he's, he's in outer space. He can, he can see the earth going behind him, and, uh, and he's traveling very fast. And he sees the moon, and he sees all the planets. He, in his mind, he's saying, well, there goes Mars, you know, there goes Saturn, there goes Jupiter. And, and he, he looks down and he notices that he is actually doing this in his physical body. He can breathe fine. Uh, he's got the same darker pants on that he had on when he was in his condo. He's got the same T-shirt, the uh, same shoes. And, you know, he can see his hands. So he knows he's physically there. Except he's flying in outer space. Um, but, uh, you know, he, he realizes this is an astral body. Uh, out of body experience, but a different one than he's ever experienced before. And he's passing all the the, the planets, and then he, he keeps going forward. So he's expecting to see, you know, stars. And next thing he knows, he's out of our uh, solar system and still flying. And then all of a sudden, it's just blackness, the darkness of space. There's no stars. There's no nothing. Uh, he doesn't hear anything. You can see his hands. So. Uh, it, it's just total blackness around him. And um, suddenly he feels as if there's some somebody looking at him or something looking at him, and it's a dark, a penetrating stare. And it's, he described it to me as, as if you're sitting at a light and somehow you, you think the person in the next car is staring at you. So you take a quick look over there and you see what they have and they turn their head away. Um, it was this sense that something was really staring at him with these piercing thoughts and, and, and eyes. And as he looked towards the, you know, the blackness, suddenly he saw this uh, image of a figure coming towards him. And it was just coming incredibly fast. And before he, he could even you know, say, oh my God, or, or have any sense of a fear, right in front of him, floating in front of his eyes, was this, he describes it as a, a 30-foot insectoid, um, a giant insect which which we call the mantis that most people have experienced this, this being. And at the time, he had never heard of the mantis. Uh, he had barely ever heard of the graves, in fact. Uh, he wasn't into UFOs or anything. You know, his whole world evolved around the reincarnation. And so uh, before he could even be, uh, you know, frightened, this overwhelming sense of love just entered his entire body, uh, his mind, his, his emotions. It was just the most powerful love that he's ever experienced, he, he would tell me. And um, at some point, there was a telepathic communication between this being whose head was about eight feet tall and, and staring right at him. And uh, this telepathic communication was that there was a sense that he had a strong sense that he had known this being from somewhere before. And in his telepathic communication with them, he, he asked the being, you know, uh, ha- have we been together before? And the answer he got back was yes. And then 
he, he looked at the being again and he, he says, you know, as my body or as your body? And the message he got back was as an insectoid. Wow. And that, that really freaked him out to begin with. And uh, then he said, well, will we be together again? And the insect said, yes. And again, he said, as in my body or your body? And the insectoid said, no, as in her body. And it was a female. And so at that point, it was a complete wow moment for him because he had always believed that reincarnation, uh, that he had had many lives on Earth, that he might have even been an animal or even a plant at some point. But it never, ever occurred to him that reincarnation was something that took place in the entire universe and that it didn't just involve humanoids, it involved every species that exists, that you could become, you know, in your next life, you could be an insectoid. Uh, or, you know, in this life, wow. you could be, be a dog. And and when that was finished, he remembers going, being shot right back into his body again, waking up, and... Um, you know, he, he went on the Internet to, to see if he could find anything about the species. And, and you got to remember, ten, uh, you know, around 2000, even on that time, people weren't talking about mantis. Uh, people no. only really talked about the gray. That was the, the only thing everybody ever talked about. Uh, I don't even think the reptilians were even part of the conversation back then. And certainly, you know, uh, eight-foot or 30-foot insects weren't part of the equation unless you, you saw them in a, in a science fiction movie. So he had never seen this before, and then, lo and behold, on the Internet, he found a picture of what this being looked like. And uh, it was very similar to what he had seen, except no one had ever reported seeing a 30-foot one. And um, his experience with this mantid is, is interesting in because... Uh, I have talked to at least a half a dozen people who have had mantoid experiences, and every one of them, it's the exact same experience, that they are nothing but love and protection yes. and, and understanding. There is never any fear. Uh, there is no sense of, of any anything other than overwhelming love. Um, but the disturbing thing is that a lot of times the mantis beings are seen in the background when there is uh, other beings doing nasty things to you. Yes. So my conclusion on that is one of two things. Either um, the mantoids are there just to make sure they have your well-being in mind and they just want to make sure that what is ever done to you is done as, as invasive as possible and that you won't be harmed. Uh, you may feel pain, but they can't do anything about that, but, but you won't be harmed. Or the second thing is, it's an all the big giant con <laughs> that uh, that the mantis are just like anybody else, but they they want you to believe that nothing ever harmful is going to happen to you as long as they're around. Um, right. But I tell you, everybody who has seen a mantis um, has the same thing, and I always say that if I saw an eight foot creature like an insect, praying mantis suddenly popping into my bedroom. I'd be freaked out and running out the door, but uh, none of these people ever do. It's just they're overcome by love. I will tell you the first alien that I saw. Right after we get to the break, after the break, I will explain the ten to twelve foot being that I saw. Oh, you saw a big one. Too. <laughs> yes, but first I want to get to a question because Claudia from Paranormal Into the Night has been waiting a while. Have you ever talked to anybody who's been an abductee who has boarded a ship and went somewhere and came back and been able to remember the experience? Uh, yes, yes. Um, several people. Um, uh, the experiences are... Um, they, they, one of the persons in my book, uh, her name is Josie, uh, she has actually two um, unique experiences. And again, re- a little bit of reincarnation, a little bit of uh, fourth dimension comes into this. Um, she, she has an experience where she is in a spaceship, uh, and she, but she is on a table. And she can see outside the, the, uh, the rooms, uh, well, the room she's in, she sees, you know, outside the space. And she is taken somewhere where it looks like 
Saturn, but it's really not Saturn. It just sort of looks like Saturn a little ways. And when she looks out the window, she sees huge, giant columns that she describes as like buildings, but vertical buildings that seem to be hundreds of stories tall, and there's smaller ships, you know, traveling around it. Um, She doesn't know where she is, but she clearly remembers that uh, during experience. Another experience, she finds herself in a basically a one-person spaceship. The interesting thing about that experience is that uh, she's in this spaceship. She realizes who she is. She's Josie. She knows she's going somewhere. Uh, Yet when she looks down at her body, um, she sees three fingers like a gray would have. Um, And I wondered about that because um, perhaps... Uh, to get to where she had to be, uh, she couldn't go in a human form. That the consciousness had to be placed in a, a different kind of being to be able to withstand the, the rigors of that journey. Um, mm-hmm. So, um, and again, she went to a place where she saw similar type of buildings. Um, that, was, that was one incident. I'm trying to I've had other ones where they, they have been taken places where they're not quite sure if it's on Earth or not, and they've seen some calamities and things like that. Uh, um, and the coincidence you asked me about this, I, I'm, I'm, I'm co-writing another book right now with a very, very interesting person. Um, uh, Jason Quick is his name, and he's from uh, Ontario, and... Uh, his story is that um, he is a multi-dimensional time traveler. And, wow! And his story will, if if you like what if, and ask the question, what what if the world is we live in isn't what we, this is like a sequel because um, he provides uh, information that a lot of us have been thinking and wondering about, and uh, basically tells a story about uh, how. Mankind, this is just one incarnation of mankind. Uh, there have been millions and millions of different beings living on Earth, and that uh, our whole society has been alive, basically. Uh, right. Right from ancient Egypt to Atlantis to the future. Uh, he has been everywhere. And so it's, uh, he even remembers his birth. Interesting. <laughs> He has a tremendous story to tell, and that book should be out uh, early April, I hope. Bob, I'm going to get you to hold on for our final break of the night. We are talking with author Bob Mitchell, his latest book, What If? Close Encounters of the Unusual Kind. We're round and third. We're getting ready to head for home here on Space Out Radio. We'll be back after this break. Want to find out what's coming up on the Spaced Out Radio Network? Go to spacedoutradio.com where you can find our daily list of shows and guests appearing throughout the week. Want to tell us your story? Be sure to sign up for the Spaced Out Forum for free. Maybe you have a psychic question. Drop in and say hi to Catherine in Cat's Corner. Spacedoutradio.com, your 24-hour source for UFOs, ghosts, conspiracies, and more. Check it out today. Are you one of many who's had a UFO or ET experience? Listen up. The AZ UFO Show is on every Sunday night at 7 on the Spaced Out Radio Network. We talk about UFO sightings across the globe, conspiracy theories, government cover-ups, and more with me, Rich Giordano. I want you to know what's going on in the skies above you, so tune in to the AZ UFO Show on Spaced Out Radio Network on spacedoutradio.com right before Spaced Out Weekend. Our show is literally out of this world. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, how can you afford not to get one? Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com for mind, body, and spirit. And expect a miracle. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. 
A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? Brand new discovery beats NASA. This is Patrick Webster Small bringing you the Webster Phenomena every Monday night at 8 p.m. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to talk about amazing stuff. Have amazing guests. That's all there is, man. You know the rest as E.T. is up in the sky. I'm going to tell you which way and why. And we're going to have a little combo about these E.T.s in the sky. We're going to chill. This is Patrick Webster Small, and I'll be seeing you every Monday night at 8 p.m. Pacific Time. Write it down on Spaced Out Radio. Is the 24-hour world starting to wear you down? Let me, from Rivulet Reiki and Ratings, lend you a hand. Hi, this is Jolene, and if you're in need of Reiki or a realm rating, come to my website, rivuletrnr.wix.com forward slash rivulet rnr, and let us help you out. At Rivulet, I specialize in healing your body, mind, and soul, no matter where you are. And be sure to check out the Rivulet R&R Facebook page for your best deals. Remember, it's time for you to make some time for you. Hi there, this is Jim Tyson, host of Spaced Out Weekend. When you've had a busy week and you're just wanting to chill out and relax, how about listening into my show? That's right, Spaced Out Weekend. I focus on the paranormal, the arcane, I even dip into the techie side of things, and much, much more. And I would love for you to come in and check it out. Remember, Spaced Out Radio goes seven days a week. Dave Scott, Monday through Friday, and me, Jim Tyson, rolling through the weekends. I look forward to having you stop by for a listen every Saturday and Sunday night, 1 a.m. Eastern, 10 p.m. Pacific, only on Spaced Out Radio. Miss most of tonight's show? Don't worry, you didn't miss a thing. You can head to our website, where you can download the podcast at spacedoutradio.com. Now, back to tonight's show. Here's Dave Scott. Welcome back for the final half hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. Tomorrow night, C.J. Friesman will be our guest. We're going to talk more E.T. contact. What do they want with us? Let's find out tomorrow night on Spaced Out Radio. Hey, to, if you want to follow us on Twitter, you can do so at Spaced Out Radio. You can give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. You can also join us on Instagram, Dave Scott, S-O-R. Our YouTube page, you can subscribe to it, is Spaced Out Radio Show. And, of course, our website, which will have a new look probably by week's end, is spacedoutradio.com. Tonight we are talking with UFO author Bob Mitchell, his latest book, What If? Close Encounters of the Unusual Kind. And, Bob, we bring you right back into the show. Thank you so much for joining us. I know it's late where you are, but it's you're absolutely incredible. It's been uh, fun so far, and it's been fast, so it doesn't seem like it's almost 3 o'clock in the morning. I, I, I know what it's like. It's not the first time I've heard that. And trust me, our our listeners get really pissed off with me that we're only a two hour show, and oh. we're we're in the we're in the process of going to extend that to three hours. But uh, it's uh, it's pretty incredible. I would love to be able to bring you back on again soon Anytime. because I Anytime. I know you I know you have a ton more stories to share with yeah. us. Yeah. Before the break, we were really getting into personal experiences with what people were having. Claudia in the paranormal into the night chat room would like to know are a lot of these sightings followed up with military or military men in black showing up in Canada here um i don't think men in black really <coughs> come into the inqu- equation um none of the people that i've talked to have ever mentioned men in the black to me um uh, although i do know of one case uh, very close to where I live, uh, but he doesn't want to talk. <laughs> um, his story is, is as fascinating as any one I know, but uh, he's the only person I know that had a, a Men in Black uh, connection. Um, there are several people over the last few years that have contacted me uh, after the, the event, and, and the event is basically a sighting, uh, nothing to do with the experiences. So um, sometimes I, I take them with a grain of salt because uh, 
um, as I said, lights in the sky don't interest me much anymore. But uh, they said that they've seen, uh, you know, strange lights in the sky followed by uh, helicopters that should not be there at, you know, three o'clock in the morning and or planes. Uh, I know it happens quite a lot in the United States because there, there are much many more military bases in the states. Um, up here, we don't have that many military bases that uh, have jets flying in and out all the time. Um, so uh, that may be one of the reasons. But um, really, um, the men in black is something that I'm not really familiar with because I've never had to deal with it. Um, mm-hmm. um, so I can't give you an answer on that one. Um, I know what some people think they are, but uh, but I don't have any you know personal experience from talking to anybody who's ever experienced them. A follow-up question from Claudia on this is, during a lot of these sightings, have the Canadian military been watching? Because there's a lot of stories out of the U.S. that say the U.S. military has been keeping an eye or tracking these extraterrestrial abductions. Um, The only thing I can tell you about that is that... um and I can't not remember who released this. I I think it might have been um, I don't know if you know Victor Vigiani. Yes. And, um, okay. He um, he gave me a document last year that uh, came from the uh, Canadian Minister of Defense. I think I think he did a an FOI uh, uh, wanting to know about you know what the Canadian government how many sightings they had and. The figure that he was given was that um, they get an average of, I believe it was 15,000 reports a year. And of those 15, 75 are contact experiences. Now, they never explained what a contact experience was, but I have to assume it means that a, you know, a jet has been sent up to you know, investigate and have seen something. I don't think they mean an alien has contacted them. Um, right. But none of this is ever publicized, and, and that's the problem with what's happened in Canada, is that uh, our government and our you know, our court system and everything is far more secretive than anything in the United States. I mean, I talked to you know reporters in the United States, and, and especially police reporters, and when I was a crime reporter, and, and they can't believe how I was able to do my job because... Really, you know, once a person gets arrested up here, it's like you don't hear anything until they go to trial. I mean, it's very hard to to really get any information uh, out of any government official or, uh, uh, you know, police officer or anything to do with that. Um, so, I, I mean, how many officially it happens, I don't know, but uh, it's certainly not something that makes the newspaper every day. Eugene on Facebook is asking... Bob, do you feel that aliens are connected to a demonic realm? Uh, no, no, I, I, I don't. I don't believe that at all. Um, I, I don't think I ever believed that. And, and um, from what I've learned in my latest book that isn't out yet, uh, um, how can I explain this? Um, there are far more beings than you could ever imagine that exist in the fourth dimension that are around us all the time. Um, we don't know that. We don't see them. But they are around us, and they they, they actually feed off our energy. Um, and, and if you have nothing but happy thoughts and, uh, you know, do good deeds and are always happy and lucky and loving... Um, they don't stick around you. If you have a bad thought, the more you frightened you are, the more scared you are. It uh, the energy human body produces is basically a food source for these uh, fourth dimensional beings. And and uh, mass traumatic events like 9/11, uh, you know, everybody was traumatized by that. And for a long time, these beings were just sucking the energy out of all of us. Um, so if people think about demonic beings as being, you know, the devil and all that, and, and really what I've been led to understand is that uh, they are not demonic, but they are 
evil, you know, beings that just try to suck the bad energy out of you. And uh, I mean, if you believe and think you're going to go to hell when you die, and, and of course I believe in reincarnation now more than ever. After what I what I think is that is that you will uh, you will go where you think you're going to go, mm-hmm. and but you won't stay there. Uh, it's not a permanent thing. Um, but I get into a lot of that in the, in the uh, new book. But um, to answer the question, no, I do not believe that uh, aliens are anything to do with demonic uh, beings at all. Pat Panda has a question for you. She is asking, have you noticed an increase in animal mutilations with increased sightings recently? Uh, no, but there was one in um, Alberta this summer that was actually quite comical, I thought, for their explanation. I don't know if you heard about that one or read about it. No, um, I did not. Okay, um, I'm trying to remember all the details. But there was a farm in Alberta where uh, uh, you know the husband and wife had reported that uh, their cattle was, was mutilated. Um, and uh, it, it was happening you know, several times that week, and, and they couldn't get anybody to... Um, to end up going out and, and looking at it, and uh, and eventually the RCMP did come out and uh, they investigated uh, the cattle mutilation. And this was a typical mutilation where the where the the bowels were, were blown out and the eye sockets were taken out. And um, the official word on from the RCMP and the government of Alberta was that uh, these. Uh, Livestock had eaten a, a poisonous plant, and the plant had uh, caused them to bloat, and they exploded from within. And that was their explanation. Um, hmm. I don't think any livestock person in the world has ever found that to be true, and these people just thought that was the most ridiculous explanation they ever heard. Um, I don't know what the outcome was, or if it had stopped or ended, but uh, it, it doesn't happen a lot. Um, it, it, it happens. I, I don't think it really happens as much as most people would think it does, too. Um, and I have also uh, been told that uh, most of that is is part of the you know the government plan to make us fear aliens because they're doing it, but blaming the aliens for doing it. So it's just part of another you know global conspiracy to make us fear aliens. Mm-hmm. I have no idea. That is the million-dollar question when it comes down to it. I mean, when you look at people's experiences, do you think that too many people are trying to figure out what is going on, Bob, rather than focusing on the experiencers and what they are going through? Because as a journalist, you're telling a story. You're telling about what people are going through. Yet most conferences out there and most people who are researching are basically saying we can't count on the experiencers anymore because their information can be flawed. We need to go further. We need disclosure. We need everything. Yet the the people who are having these experiences, good or bad, are just trying to figure out what the hell is going on. Uh, yeah, because I see, I, I think when you talk to the, the people that it's, that it's affecting them, you're talking to you know, first-hand witnesses, um, and and uh, you know, you can tell pretty quickly if they're lying to you. I mean, most of the people I've talked to, they're actually you can see the emotion. There's genuine fear, um, and some of them I've actually you know written about while they've been under hypnosis. So uh, it's not that um, you know they're making this stuff up, and they and, and they never seem to try to explain things they can't explain. Uh, even the blackouts, I mean, they, they don't try to add things that happen during the blackout. It's just there's nothing there in their mind uh, uh, that happens. But but I do think, um, you see, the ex- disclosure thing is, is an interesting uh, concept to, to wish for, but if what really is happening, and I mean that the government is in cahoots allowing... Uh, you know, abductions to be taken place in return for technology, um, how in the world would they ever be able to tell the general public that? Uh, there would be mass riots. There would be, you know, revolts. Uh, 
So I, I you know, it would be the most public relations uh, disaster in the history, I think, of mankind. If, if anybody got up and said, well, you know, sorry about uh, all these abductions, but you, you've got these great big TVs now, and you you have these cell phones and all this technology, and uh, yada, yada, yada. But, uh, you know, uh, abduction was a small price to pay for all those good things you've got. Uh, uh, I, I don't think the public would stand for it. So I, I don't, as much as I would hope, Disclosure happens. I uh, I can't see how it happens. Um, the way we, you know, somebody making a public, you know, having a news conference. I I, I think the only way it will happen is if uh, there are mass uh, sightings and and mass uh, experiences all at once, and then nobody mm-hmm. will be able to say it didn't happen. Bob Kelly on Twitter is asking. If aliens are not demonic, what are they then? Please tell. Um, they're they're just another species. Like mankind, the, the humankind is is one species in an entire universe. Um, um, from what I understand, we're probably the the lowest of the, the lowest species because the third dimensional world is a very it's a it's a static world. Uh, most other species have learned to, over, over the years, to evolve, and, and one day we will too. Um, there are other species that exist in the third dimensional world, but they also have the ability to go to fourth dimensional worlds. And, and if you believe um, Satyana, who's talking with his uh, um, Swami, there are you know dimensions up to the 13th, 14th, 15th dimension. Um, it's hard for people to wrap this around their mind that the the existence that we have is the only kind of existence in the entire universe. Uh, uh, and, and that doesn't say there's not a God or not a higher source because uh, even the aliens, uh, you know, that, that have experienced our experiences, they have told them that, you know, they believe in a higher power too. So um, I think we're sort of you know, narcissistic in a way if you think that mankind is the only species that matters in the world. Uh, it's a, a lot bigger uh, game than that. I think your puppy wanted to chime in on that answer, yeah, too. She wasn't yeah, agreeing she, with you. Yeah, she wants to get jumped up on, on the couch here, but she's uh, a shih tzu, so she, she can't uh, yeah. jump. I've got to try to yeah. reach over while I'm doing it. Hold on one second. Yeah, not a problem. Okay, she's closer to me now. Claudia has a question, and I think it's a very interesting question. Okay. In regards to First Nations here in Canada, have oh, we yeah. seen it? Have we seen a lot of reports or incidences with encounters of aliens and possibly Bigfoot coming out of the First Nations recently? Well, I live close to a Six Nations uh, reserve in Brantford, and and I've talked to some people down there, and. Um, they look at it uh, almost as part of a normal part of existence. It's not a big deal to them if they see something in the sky. And uh, many of them have told me that it's it's they see them all the time. Um, um, and and sometimes the the lights in the sky are almost um, almost like a mural. Uh, I've I've seen a couple of pictures that they've sent me, and it really looks something is drawing faces in the sky. Um, I, had, I saw one picture, and I cannot explain this one, and I've never been able to find the guy who actually took the picture, but it's a picture uh, that appears to be a man uh, engulfed in fire, walking down a uh, rural road on this uh, native reserve. And uh, the story I heard is that uh, this man saw this being come out of a, a ship land on the ground and he was engulfed in fire and just started walking and disappeared. <laughs> um, the picture is kind of blurry, but it does look like a man and it does look like he's on fire. Um, but I've never been able to find the guy. And the, the person that told me that doesn't know where they got it, but it came to the local newspaper a few years ago. But um, they, they, they regularly see UFOs. I, I, I don't hear a lot of stories of actually them seeing a being or having encounters, but they, they say they're always in the sky. 
do you, do you, Karen has a question from the Space Out Radio chat room. Mm-hmm. And what it's basically about is we hear a lot about of these alien bases that are around the world. Do you believe there are any in Canada, more specifically around the secretive base of Suffield in Alberta? Uh, I don't know about Suffield, Alberta. One of the persons in my latest book tells me about uh, um, um, a traveling that he did uh, where he was taken to a spaceship and basically shown a map of the world, and there was colored dots. There was green dots, blue dots, and red dots. And the uh, the dots uh, were the... Uh, I may have this order wrong, but the... The green dots were uh, the alien species that were uh, uh, benevolent to mankind. Uh, the the red dots were the bad dudes, and the uh, blue dots were indifferent. They're they're here, but they don't really play much of a role. They're just here as part of a base, and when they move on. But uh, there were a lot of dots. Uh, in Canada, and most of the dots in Canada were benevolent races, um, and, and these were supposed to be all underground bases, uh, and there were thousands around the world, uh, um, a lot around the Great Lakes, and there would have been some, you know, in, in the British Columbia, I'm sure, and, and uh, in Alberta, I'm sure. Um, most of the bad ones, though, were in the United States, <laughs> so uh, that may go about what you said at the beginning of the show, where that... Uh, Canadians are pretty cool compared to uh, the Americans when it comes to aliens. Well, maybe they just like our beer and donuts. Maybe, maybe. We, maybe they like stronger beer. Maybe they're exactly. hockey fans. Maybe they're hockey fans. <laughs> well, the way your laps and my canots are playing right now, I don't think it's uh, very good. <laughs> But, but yeah, well, maybe they're blue, maybe they're baseball fans too, or, or, or basketball fans for Raptors. So <laughs> yeah, that, that we we won't go into the NBA. That's still a sore yeah, spot for too, me around too, Vancouver. Too bad, too bad that your team yeah. got taken away. I know. I hear you there. We are talking with author Bob Mitchell tonight on Space Out Radio. His latest book, as well as all of his books, can be found on Amazon.com. What if? Close Encounters of the Unusual Kind is the story we are talking about today. Now, when you hear of someone having extraterrestrial encounters, are they mainly in a dream state, or are you getting a lot of people who are seeing them while they're wide awake, maybe in the middle of the day or maybe in the evening, daytime, nighttime, doesn't really matter, but are they seeing it consciously? Uh, Some of them see it consciously. Uh, Most of them starts out in a dream state, which is why I, I think the fourth dimension and the astral travel comes into play. Uh, but some of them have been completely awake. In fact, the, the Josie uh, woman who, who I wrote about in my latest book, um, she uh, basically says that uh, from, from since a little kid, she's had nightmares every night, yet she can never remember the nightmares. She, she's never... She just knows she wakes up in a terrible state and screaming. And and uh, since quite recently, January of 2015 is when is when uh, her actual abductions have been taking place. And and most of them start exactly the same way. She has an absolute horrific nightmare. She wakes up. She's in bed. She's uh, you know just terrified. She can't remember anything that's just happened to her, and then all of a sudden she feels her body being shot up uh, into the air. And she's in an astral traveling experience at that point. Um, She swears that she's completely awake, that it's not an extension of her dreams. Um, And and again, uh, people that tell me that they they fall asleep and then they uh, end up in this dream state and then they are experiencing uh, very vivid experiences abductions, they all tell me that uh, it's a different feeling than in a dream. Uh, they know what a dream feels like. This doesn't feel like a dream. And anybody who's experienced this, I, I think, probably has the same experience. That, that you know, people who are skeptical will say, oh, you're just dreaming. It's just, you're, you know, you, you saw something on TV and, and you're making this up. But uh, the people that have had experiences, they all tell you that it, it, 
definitely a different feeling. And and a lot of these people, you know, have told me that they never even thought about aliens. They, they never even watched TV. They never like uh, shows like this. And yet these images are in their mind. So uh, they don't know how they're in there if they've never seen it before. It's interesting because the stories, they all seem to intertwine, but they're yeah. all so different every time you hear them. Yeah, I mean, they're... they're they don't all have the same ending. Well, I guess they have the same ending because most of them are, are brought back. But I have this theory, again, that not all of them are brought back because, uh, again, I, I'm I'm told that in the United States alone, you know, more than a million people go missing every year. Now, mm-hmm. some, now some of them surely are... are killed by, you know, sick people and murdered by spouses or abducted by sexual predators and and, and some of them, you know, commit suicide. Um, but where are all the rest that are never found? That's I mean, right. Can't, can't all be just running away deliberately. Mm-hmm. And, and there's a couple of books, David Politis has written a couple of books, 411, about the missing mm-hmm. people in, in the parks, but um, I, I just think that it's it's it, it, it's not sensible that all these people disappear and they never come back. They never found. For you sure, have go, you have to go somewhere. Bob Mitchell, I want to say thank you for being on Space Out Radio tonight. I could have done another two hours with you. Uh, yes, it was very enjoyable, and I hope uh, our our listeners were entertained and um, and learned something. They're already asking when you're coming back. We'll set that up afterwards. Thank you so much for being on the show. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Do you have a topic or guest you'd like to hear on Spaced Out Radio? Email us, dave at spacedoutradio.com. Send us a quick message on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio or a message on our Facebook page, Spaced Out Radio. Once again, here's Dave Scott. And once again, I want to thank author Bob Mitchell for coming on Space Out Radio tonight. Stories, man. I absolutely love the stories. It's absolutely great to be able to have someone of that journalistic stature be able to tell us the stories he did tonight. Amazon.com. You can find his latest book, What If? Close Encounters of the unusual kind, as well as his other books like Incident at Pleasant Ridge. we got to get into that with him next time when he's on the air. Tomorrow night on the show, we're staying with ET Contact. Experiencer C.J. Friesman will be with us. We're going to get a personal look at what it's like to be taken. We're going to find out tomorrow night with CJ. Hey, if you want to follow us on Twitter, you can do so at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. You can also ask to join our Spaced Out Radio group as well as Podcast Central. On Instagram, you can follow me at Dave Scott, S-O-R. Our YouTube channel, subscribe to it today, Spaced Out Radio Show. And our website is spacedoutradio.com. I will be back in the hot seat in exactly 22 hours from now. I hope you're back listening in. Thank you so much for you in the Spaced Out Radio chat room at Paranormal Forum and at Paranormal Into the Night. We love having you follow us. You make the night so much more fun. Take care. We'll talk to you in exactly 22 hours. Good night.